introduction of the mystical city of god volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda introduction when i was ready to present before the throne of god the insignificant results of my labors in writing the first part of the most holy life of mary the mother of god i wished to subject it to the scrutiny and correction of the divine light by which i had been guided in my shortcomings i was very anxious to be consoled by the renewed assurance and benign approval of the most high and to know whether he wished me to continue or to abandon this work which is so far above my lowliness the lord responded saying thou hast written well and according to our pleasure but we desire thee to understand that in order to manifest the mysteries and most high sacraments of the rest of the life of our only and chosen spouse mother of our only begotten thou hast need of a new and more exalted preparation it is our wish that thou die to all that is imperfect and visible and that thou live according to the spirit that thou renounce all the occupations and habits of an earthly creature and assume instead those of an angel striving to attain in them a still greater purity and an entire conformity with that thou art to understand and write in this answer of the most high i understood that such a high perfection of life and habits and such an unwanted exercise of virtues was proposed and required of me that full of diffidence i became disturbed and fearful of undertaking a work so arduous and difficult for an earthly creature i felt within myself great repugnance rising up in the flesh against the spirit the spirit called me with interior force urging me to strive after the disposition which was required of me and advancing as argument the pleasure of the lord and the benefits accruing to myself on the other hand the law of sin romans chapter seven verse twenty three which i felt in my members opposed the divine promptings and discouraged me by the fear of my own inconstancy i felt a great distaste which deterred me and a great pusillanimity which filled me with fear in this excitement i began to believe that i was not capable of treating about such high things especially as they were so foreign to the condition and estate of a woman overcome by fears and difficulties i resolved not to continue this work and to use all possible means to adhere to this determination the common enemy knew my fear and cowardice and as his utmost cruelty is more aroused against the weak and disheartened he made use of this very disposition to attack me with incredible fury it seemed to him that i was left without help in his hands in order to conceal his malice he sought to transform himself into an angel of light pretending to be very solicitous for my soul and for my welfare under this false pretext he perfidiously deluged me with his suggestions and doubts he represented to me the danger of damnation and frightened me with punishments similar to those of the chief of the angels isaiah chapter fourteen verse twelve since i had sought in my pride to comprehend what was above my powers and in opposition to god himself he pointed out to me many souls who professing virtue were deceived by some secret presumption and by yielding to the insinuations of the devil and he made me believe that in so far as i sought to scrutinize the secrets of the divine majesty proverbs chapter twenty five verse twenty seven i could not but be guilty of pride and presumption thus being already judged he urged very strongly that the present times were ill-suited for such matters and sought to confirm his assertion by what happened to some well-known persons who were found to labor under deceit and error he reminded me of the dread of the spiritual life in others how great would be the discredit which would arise by any mistake of mine and what evil effect it would have on those of little piety all this i would know by experience and to my regret if i persisted in writing about this matter and as it is true evidently that all the opposition to the spiritual life and the small esteem in which the mystic virtues are held 
is caused by that mortal enemy so for the purpose of doing away with christian devotion and piety in many souls he succeeds in deceiving some and in sowing the cockle among the good seed of the lord matthew chapter thirteen verse twenty five thus he causes confusion and obscures the true sentiment concerning it making it more difficult to distinguish the darkness from the light i am not surprised to see him succeed therein as the true discernment is the special work of god and of those who participate in his true wisdom and do not govern themselves only by earthly insight it is not easy during this mortal life to discern true prudence from the false for often also the good intention and zeal warp the human judgment when counsel and light from on high are wanting i had occasion to learn this in the execution of that which i am about to undertake for some persons well known as devout not only those who loved me on account of their piety and desired my welfare but also those who were less loving and considerate all alike at one time wished to deter me from this undertaking and also from the path which i was going as if i was proceeding upon it by my own choice their fear of drawing discredit or confusion upon those who were striving after piety with me or upon religion or my neighbors and especially upon the convent in which i lived caused them anxiety and to me affliction i was much enamored by the security which the ordinary paths of the other nuns seemed to offer i acknowledge that this suited more my own insight and my inclination and desires and was urged upon me still more by my timidity and my great fears cast about upon the impetuous waves my heart sought to reach the port of obedience in order to reassure me in the bitter sea of my confusion to add to my tribulation it began to be rumored about in our order that my spiritual father and superior who had for many years directed my soul and who well understood my interior trials who moreover had commanded me to write the preceding part of this history who would most likely encourage quiet and console me was suggested for removal to a higher office the suggestion was not acted upon but it occasioned his absence for many days and the dragon took advantage of all this in order to pour out against me the furious river of his wrath apocalypse chapter thirteen verse fifteen thus though in vain he exerted all his malice on this occasion and others to entice me from obedience and deprive me of the guidance of my superior and master in addition to all the contradictions and temptations already mentioned and many others not possible to describe the demon sought to deprive me of my health causing many aches indispositions and disorders of the whole body he harassed me with insurmountable sadness and conflicting thoughts he seemed to confuse my understanding hinder correct thinking weaken my will power and sift me in body and soul and it happened that in the midst of this confusion i committed some faults which were serious enough in me although they were committed not so much in malice as from human frailty nevertheless the serpent sought to use them for my destruction more than any other means for thus having interrupted the flow of good works his fury was let loose to cause still greater faults in this embarrassment by inveigling me to exaggerate my guilt to this he drove me by impious and more insidious suggestions seeking to persuade me that all i had experienced in the path which i had trodden was false and erroneous as these insinuations on account of the faults committed and on account of my continual consternation and fears began to appear plausible i resisted them less than others and it was only through the special mercies of the lord that i did not fall entirely from all belief and hope in a remedy but i found myself so entangled in difficulties and surrounded by darkness that i may say the groanings of death encompassed me and the sorrows of hell engulfed me psalm seventeen verse five inspiring me with dread of extreme peril i resolved to burn the manuscripts of the first part of this divine history and to desist from writing the second the angel of satan who inspired me with this resolution induced me also to withdraw myself from the whole undertaking to put an end to the pursuit of the spiritual life to neglect my interior life 
and not to communicate about it with any one. Thus would I be able to do penance for my sins, appease the Lord, propitiate him, and retain his friendship. In order to make sure of the effects of his concealed malice, he proposed that I make a vow not to write any more, on account of the danger of being deceived and of deceiving, but that instead I amend my life, retrench my imperfections, and embrace penance. With this mask of seeming virtue, the dragon pretended to establish his damnable counsels and cover himself with the skin of a sheep, while in reality he acted as a bloodthirsty and devouring wolf. He persevered for some time in this attack, and all alone I remained for fifteen days in a night of darkness, without relief or consolation, either human or divine, without the former, because I was without the help and the counsel of obedience, and without the latter, because the Lord had interrupted the flow of his favors, his enlightenments, and continual inspiration. Above all, I was distressed by despair of salvation, and in it, the persuasion that death and the danger of my eternal damnation was approaching. All this was instigated and fostered in me by the enemy. But as the aftertastes of his temptations are so bitter, and end but in despair, the very disturbance, by which he upset the whole republic of my powers and acquired habits, made me more wary of fulfilling anything which he urged on me and proposed to me. He availed himself of the continual fear which tormented me with the dread of offending God and of losing his friendship. And when, in my doubts, I applied myself to works of piety, he sought to draw me away. This very fear, however, made me hesitate at what the astute dragon had tried to convince me of, and in this uncertainty I deferred giving assent to it. My high regard for obedience also, by which I had been ordered to write, and the contrariness of that which I felt in my interior, helped me to resist and to recoil at his suggestions. Above all, the assistance of the Most High defended me, and permitted not the beasts to snatch my soul, which amid sighs and groans confessed him. I cannot describe in words the temptations, combats, troubles, dismays, and afflictions which I suffered in this battle, for I saw myself placed in such a state that in my judgment there really was no greater difference between my condition and that of the damned, except that in hell there is no redemption, while in mine it was still possible. One day, in order to get some respite, I cried out from the bottom of my heart, saying, O oh, woe is me, that I have come to such a state, and woe to my soul, which finds itself therein! Whither shall I turn, since all the portals of my salvation are closed? Immediately a strong and sweet voice gave answer within myself, Whither dost thou wish to go outside of God himself? By this answer I perceived that my cure was at hand in the Lord, and at the breaking of this dawn I began to raise myself from the depth of the confusion into which I was cast, and I felt a powerful increase in the fervor of my desires and in the acts of faith, hope, and charity. I debased myself in the presence of the Most High, and in firm confidence in His goodness, I wept over my faults with bitter sorrow. I confessed them many times, and sighing from the depth of my heart, I began to seek again the former light and truth. And as the divine wisdom comes forth to meet those by whom it is invoked. Wisdom, chapter 6, verse 17. It advanced towards me in delight, and cleared away the night of my confusion and tormenting afflictions. Presently that bright day broke, which I had desired so much, the quiet possession of peace returned. I enjoyed the sweet love and vision of my Lord and Master, and with it I again perceived why I should believe, accept and esteem the benefits and favors which his mighty arm wrought in me. I gave him thanks as far as was in my power, and I saw who I was and who God is, that a creature by itself can do nothing, that it is nothing, because sin is nothing. I saw also what man can do when raised up and assisted up by the divine right hand, being much more than can be imagined by our earthly faculties. Humbled in the perception of these truths, and in the presence of the inaccessible light, which is vast and strong, without deceit or falsehood, my heart flowed over in sweet affections of love, praise, and thanksgiving. 
for now i understood that he had guarded and defended me so that in the confused night of temptations my lamp might not be extinguished proverbs chapter thirty one verse eighteen and in the depth of my gratitude i annihilated myself to the dust and humiliated myself as a worm of the earth to make this benefit more certain i immediately heard an interior exhortation without knowing clearly from whence it proceeded while it severely reprehended me for my disloyalty and my wrongful ways it at the same time admonished and enlightened instructed and corrected me it furnished me with a deep understanding of good and evil of virtue and vice of what was secure useful and beneficial as well as their contraries it laid open to me the way of eternity gave me a knowledge of the means and of the end of the value of life everlasting and of the miserable unhappiness and the so little considered ruin of endless perdition in the profound knowledge of these two extremes i confess that i was dumbfounded and cast about between the fear of my dreadful infirmity and the desire of reaching the happiness of which i was unworthy on account of my demerits i was full of the thought of the kindness and mercy of the most high and the fear of losing him i beheld the two different ends awaiting the creatures eternal glory and eternal misery and it seemed a small matter to me to suffer all the pains and the torments of the world of purgatory and hell itself in order to attain to the one and to avoid the other and although i perceived that the divine help is assured to those who seek to make use of it yet as i also saw by this light that life and death are also in our hands ecclesiasticus chapter fifteen verse eighteen and that our weakness or malice may prevent the proper use of grace and that the tree will lie for all eternity as it once has fallen ecclesiastes chapter eleven verse three on this account i was overcome by the deepest sorrow which penetrated my heart this sorrow was increased by a most severe answer or inquiry which came from the lord for while i found myself thus annihilated in the consciousness of my weakness and danger and by the thought of having offended his justice so that i dared not raise my eyes toward him he met my speechless sorrow by the advances of his mercy saying to me in answer to them which dost thou wish my soul which dost thou seek which of these ways wilt thou choose what is thy resolve this question was an arrow to my heart for although i knew for certain that the lord knew my desires better than myself the delay between the question and the answer was incredibly painful to me i wished if possible that the lord should anticipate my answer and should not show himself ignorant of the response which i would give but impelled by great emotion i made response in words coming from my innermost soul and said lord and omnipotent god the path of virtue the way of eternal life do i choose this do i desire and in this do thou place me and as i do not merit it in thy justice i appeal to thy mercy and offer for myself the infinite merits of thy most holy son and my redeemer jesus christ i was made aware that this highest judge remembered the promise which is given to the church that he would grant all that is asked in the name of his only begotten john chapter sixteen verse twenty three that in him and on his account my petition was granted and its fulfillment hastened according to my poor wishes certain conditions were made and proposed to me by an intellectual voice saying to me interiorly soul created by the hand of the almighty if thou wishest as one of the elect to follow in the path of the true light and attain the position of a most chaste spouse of the lord who calls thee it is befitting that thou observe the laws and precepts of love the first thing required of thee is that thou reject entirely all earthly inclinations renouncing all and every affection toward the transient things so that thou have no love or affection toward any created being no matter how useful beautiful or agreeable it may appear to thee cherish no created image harbor no earthly affection let thy will rest in no created object except in so far as thy lord and spouse shall command thee for the well-ordering of thy love 
or in so far as thou canst be aided thereby to love him alone and when after thus reaching this perfect abnegation and renunciation of thyself thou shalt have freed and disentangled thyself from all earthly things seek the lord raising thyself with swift wings of the dove toward the high habitation in which he in his condescension wishes to place thy spirit so that there thou mayest live in his presence and have a secure dwelling place this great lord is a most jealous spouse and his love and emulation are strong as death canticles chapter eight verse six he wishes to adorn thee and set thee free in a secure place in order that thou mayest not issue from it or leave his presence for another where thou findest him not or enjoyest not his caresses he with whom thou art to converse without mistrust wishes to sign thee with his own hand and this is a most equitable law which the spouses of the great king must observe for even those in the world observe it in order to show their faithfulness it is due to the nobility of thy spouse that thou observe a behavior corresponding to the dignity and position conferred by him without descending to anything not befitting this estate or making thee unworthy of the adornment lavished upon thee for entrance into his bridal chamber next i require of thee that thou despoil thyself with diligence of the vestments torn by thy faults and imperfections soiled by the effects of sin and made odious by the inclinations of nature his majesty wishes to wash off the stains to purify and renew thee with his beauty but under condition that thou never lose sight of the poor and despicable vestments of which thou hast been divested so that in the memory and knowledge of this benefit thou mayest spread the odour of sweetness for this great king by the nard of thy humility canticles chapter one verse eleven and so that thou mayest never forget the return which thou owest to the author of thy salvation thus will he by the precious balsam of his blood purify thee heal thy wounds and enlighten thee copiously in addition to all this this voice continued to say in order that thus forgetting all earthly things thou mayest be coveted by the highest king seek to adorn thyself with the jewels which he in his pleasure has prepared for thee the vestments which shall cover thee are to be whiter than the snow more brilliant than the diamond more resplendent than the sun yet they will be at the same time so delicate that they will easily be spoiled by any negligence making thee abominable in the sight of thy spouse but if thou preserve them in the purity which he desires thy steps will be beautiful as the prince's daughter canticles chapter seven verse one and his majesty will be pleased with thy sentiments and thy words as a cincture of thy vestment he will give thee the knowledge of his divine power and his holy fear in order that having bound thy inclinations thou mayest direct thyself by his pleasure the jewels of thy necklace which adorn thy neck signifying thy humble submission shall be the costly stones of faith hope and charity as a clasp for thy hair which are the high and exalted thoughts and thy heavenly intelligences thou wilt have from him the infused science and wisdom and the embroideries of thy vestments shall be all the beauty and richness of the virtues thy diligence in performing what is most perfect shall serve thee as sandals and the laces shall be the avoidance and restraints that thou wilt use in order to keep from evil the rings which will beautify thy fingers shall be the seven gifts of the holy ghost and the beauty of thy face shall be the participation of the divinity which on account of his holy love shall shine therefrom thereto thou shalt add the colouring of confusion for having offended him in order that it may make thee ashamed of offending him in the future comparing at the same time the coarse and sordid habits of the past with those that now adorn thee and because thy own merits would make but a poor and miserable return for such a high espousal the most high wishes to ratify this contract by singling out as if for thee alone the infinite merits of thy spouse jesus christ and he makes thee a partaker of all his possessions and treasures in the heavens and upon earth for all belongs to this supreme lord esther chapter thirteen verse eleven and of all this thou shalt be mistress as his spouse 
for thy own use and for the greater love of him but remember soul that in order to obtain such a gift thou must hide all this within thyself without ever losing thy secret for i warn thee of the danger of soiling thy beauty with the least imperfection but if at any time thou committest such an imperfection out of weakness rise from it at once like a strong one and acknowledging it weep over the small fault as if it had been the most grievous and in order that thou mayest have a dwelling place and habitation befitting such a great estate thy spouse does not wish to set thee any limit but it is his pleasure that thou dwell in the infinite regions of his divinity and that thou roam about and disport thyself through the illimitable fields of his attributes and perfections where the view of the intellect is without restraint where the will is delighted without shadow of misgiving and where the inclinations are satiated without bitterness this is the paradise always delightful where the most beloved brides of christ find their recreation where they gather the fragrant flowers and myrrh and where the infinite is found for those that have renounced the imperfect nothing there will thy habitation be secure and in order that thy intercourse and companionship may be in correspondence with it i desire that thou converse with the angels holding them as friends and companions and copying from them during their frequent conversations and intercourse with thee their virtues by faithful imitation take notice continued the voice o soul of the greatness of this benefit for the mother of thy spouse and the queen of heaven adopts thee anew for her daughter receives thee as her disciple and assumes the place of a mother and of a teacher toward thee through her intercession dost thou receive these special favors and they are all granted to thee that thou mayest write her most holy life on this account thou hast been pardoned without thy merit and that which otherwise thou wouldst not have reached has been conceded to thee what would become of thee o soul if it were not for the mother of mercy thou wouldst already have perished if her intercession had failed thee poor and useless would have been thy works if by divine condescension thou hadst not been selected to write this history but the eternal father chose thee for his daughter in view of this work and for a spouse of his only begotten son and the son received thee to his close embraces and the holy spirit selected thee for his enlightenments the document of this contract and espousal is written and imprinted on the white parchment of the purity of most holy mary there the finger and the power of the most high have written it the ink is the blood of the lamb the executor is the eternal father the tie which binds thee to christ is the holy spirit the bondsmen are the merits of the same jesus christ and of his mother for thou art but a vile worm having nothing to offer and being expected to give merely thy free consent so far the admonishing voice which i heard although i judge it to be that of an angel yet whether such it was i could not ascertain clearly for i did not perceive it in the same way as at other times such manifestations and disclosures accommodate themselves to the dispositions of the soul at the time of their reception as for instance it happened to the disciples at emmaus luke chapter four verse sixteen many other experiences i had in order to overcome the opposition of the serpent against the writing of this history but it would draw out this introduction much too long to mention them now i continued my prayers for some days asking the lord to govern and direct me in order to not make a mistake and representing to him my incapacity and timidity his majesty persisted in exhorting me to ordain my life toward all purity and the greatest perfection and in urging me to continue in it after having begun and especially the queen of the angels intimated to me her will many times and with great sweetness and tenderness commanded me to obey her as her daughter and write her most holy life which i had commenced to all this i wish to add the security of obedience without saying anything of it which i had heard from the lord and from his most holy mother i asked my confessor and superior what he would direct me to do in this matter he answered by commanding me under obedience to continue and to write the second part of this history finding myself thus compelled both by the lord and by obedience 
I returned again to the presence of the Most High, where I found myself one day in prayer, and, renouncing my whole self and recognizing my insignificance and liability to err, I prostrated myself before His Majesty and said, My Lord, my Lord, what wishest thou to do with me? Whereupon I received the following intelligence. It seemed to me that the divine light of the Blessed Trinity showed me my own self full of poverty and defects, and severely reprehending me for them, furnished me at the same time with the highest doctrine and salutary directions for a perfect life, and for this purpose God purified and enlightened me anew. I became aware that the Mother of Grace, Most Holy Mary, standing before the throne of the Divinity, was interceding and pleading for me. With such assistance, my confidence took new life, and profiting by the clemency of such a mother, I addressed myself to her, and spoke to her only these words. My lady and my refuge, consider as a true mother the poverty of thy slave. It seemed to me as if she heard my prayer, and speaking with the Most High, she said, My Lord, I wish to receive this useless and poor creature anew as a daughter, and adopt her as my own. Truly this was the act of a most liberal and mighty queen. But the Most High answered, My spouse, for such a great favor as this, what does this soul bring in return? She does not deserve it, being a useless and destitute worm, and thankless for our gifts. O oh, wonderful power of the divine word! How shall I describe the effects produced in me by this answer of the all-powerful? I humbled myself to the depth of my nothingness, and was filled with the knowledge of the misery of creatures, and of my own ingratitude toward God. My heart sank within me in sorrow for my sins, and in the desire of obtaining the unmerited happiness of being the child of that sovereign. I raised my eyes full of dread to the throne of the Most High, and my visage was transported in fear and hope. I turned toward my advocate, and desiring to be admitted as her slave, since I did not merit the title of daughter, I spoke from the bottom of my heart without forming any words, and I heard the great lady say to the Lord, Divine Lord and my God, it is true, this poor creature has nothing to offer to thy justice, but I offer for her the merits and the blood which my most holy son poured out for her, and with it I present also the dignity of mother of thy only begotten son, which I receive from thy ineffable kindness, all the works which I performed in thy service in having borne him in my womb, and nourishing him with the milk of my breast, and above all I offer thee thy own bounty and divinity. I earnestly entreat thee to consider this creature as my adopted daughter and disciple, for whom I will stand security. Under my guidance she will amend her faults and perform her works according to thy pleasure. The Most High, May he be eternally praised for hearing the petition of the great queen, interceding for the least of his creatures. Yielded to these prayers, and immediately in the joy of my soul, I felt immense effects, such as are impossible to describe. With my whole heart, I turned toward all the creatures of heaven and earth, and not being able to contain my exultation, I invited them to exalt for me, and with me, the author of grace." it seemed to me that I addressed them in the following words. O ye inhabitants and courtiers of heaven, and all ye living creatures, formed by the hand of the Most High, behold this marvel of his liberality and mercy, and bless and exalt him for all eternity, since he has raised from the dust the most vile of the universe, and has enriched the most destitute. He has honored the most unworthy, though he is the highest God and the powerful King. And since you, sons of Adam, here see the poorest orphan succored, the greatest sinner pardoned, issue forth from your ignorance, raise yourself from your listlessness, and renew your hope. For if his powerful arm has assisted me, if he has called and forgiven me, all of you can hope for your salvation. And if you wish to assure yourselves of it, seek, seek the protection of the Most Holy Mary, ask for her intercession and you will find her to be the mother of ineffable mercy and clemency. I turned also to this most exalted queen, and said to her, I, O oh my lady, now do I not call myself an orphan, since I have a mother, and a mother, who is the queen of all creation. 
i shall not any more be ignorant since i have as teacher the mistress of divine wisdom not poor since i have as lord him who is master of all the treasures of heaven and earth i have a mother who protects me an instructress who teaches and corrects me a mistress who commands and governs me blessed art thou amongst all women wonderful among all creatures admirable in heaven and on earth and let all confess thy greatness with eternal praises since it is not easy or possible for the least among creatures the lowest worm of the earth to give thee any return receive it then from the divine right hand and in the divine vision where thou standest in the presence of god enjoying thyself through all eternity i shall remain thy acknowledged and bounden slave praising the almighty as long as my life shall last since his liberal mercy has so favored me as to give me my queen as my mother and teacher let my loving muteness praise thee since my tongue has not words or terms adequate for doing it for all of them are strained and limited it is not possible to describe what the soul feels during such mysterious favors they were the source of great good to my soul for immediately i was made aware of a perfection of life and of works for which i fail to find terms but all of this the most high told me was given to me on account of the most holy mary and in order to write her life it was intimated to me that by ratifying this blessing the eternal father chose me to manifest the sacraments of his daughter that the holy spirit poured out his light and inspirations that i might declare the hidden gifts of his spouse and that the most holy son appointed me to manifest the mysteries of his most pure mother mary and in order that i might become capable of this work the holy trinity enlightened and bathed my soul in a special light of the divinity and the divine power touched up my faculties as with a pencil furnishing them with new habits for the perfect execution of this work the most high also commanded me to strive to imitate with all my heart according to my weak powers all that i should understand and write about the heroic virtues and the most holy operations of the heavenly queen guiding my life according to her example knowing how unfit i am for the fulfillment of this obligation the same most kind queen offered to me anew her favor help and instruction for all that the lord commanded and pointed out to me then i asked for the blessing of the most holy trinity in order to begin the second part of this heavenly history i felt that all three persons of the godhead conferred their blessing upon me issuing from this trance i sought to wash my soul in the sacraments and full of contrition for my sins in the name of the lord and of obedience i set myself about this work for the glory of the most high and for his most holy mother the ever immaculate virgin mary this second part comprises the life of the queen of the angels from the mystery of the incarnation to the ascension of christ our lord into heaven which is the principal and the most important part of this history for it includes the whole life and mysteries of the lord himself with his passion and most holy death i wish only to remark here that the graces and blessings conceded to most holy mary in preparation for the incarnation began to flow from the moment of her immaculate conception already at that time in the intention and the decree of god she was the mother of the word but in the measure as the realization of the incarnation drew nigh the favors and gifts of grace continued to increase although they seem to be all of the same kind in nature from the beginning yet they continue to augment and increase and there are not terms new and varied enough to equal in their significance these increases and advances in the blessings conferred thus it becomes necessary in this narrative to measure all by the infinite power of the lord who giving much retains enough to give infinitely more while the capacity of each soul and especially the soul of the queen of heaven is in its way infinite being able to receive ever more and more and this happened with the soul of holy mary until she arrived at a summit of holiness and participation of the divinity to which no other creature has attained nor will ever attain in all eternity may the lord himself enlighten me that i may follow up this work according to his divine pleasure amen end of introduction
book one chapter one of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda book one contains the most exquisite preparations of the almighty for the incarnation of the word in mary most holy the circumstances accompanying this mystery the exalted state in which the blessed mother was placed her visit to saint elizabeth and the sanctification of the baptist her return to nazareth and a most memorable battle of the virgin with lucifer chapter one the most high begins to prepare in most holy mary the mystery of the incarnation the events of the nine days preceding this mystery especially the happenings of the first day in order that her most faultless life might be to all an example of the highest holiness the most high had placed upon our queen and mistress the duties of a spouse of saint joseph which was a position requiring more intercourse with her neighbors the heavenly mistress finding herself in this new estate was filled with such exalted thoughts and sentiments in the fulfillment of her duties and ordered all the activities of her life with such wisdom that she was an object of admirable emulation to the angelic spirits and an unparalleled example for men few knew her and still fewer had intercourse with her but these happy ones were so filled with that celestial influence of mary that with a wonderful joy and with unwonted flights of spirit they sought to express and manifest the light which illumined their hearts and which they knew came from her the most prudent queen was not unaware of these operations of the most high but neither was it yet time nor would her most profound humility as yet consent to their becoming known to the world she continually besought the lord to hide them from men to make all the favors of his right hand redound solely to his praise and to permit her to be ignored and despised by all the mortals in as far as his infinite goodness would not be offended thereby these prayers were accepted by her divine spouse with great benignity and his providence arranged all things in such a manner that the very light which incited men to proclaim her greatness at the same time caused them to be mute moved by divine power they refrained from expressing their thoughts inwardly praising the lord for the light which they felt within themselves filled with marvel they suspended their judgment and leaving behind the creatures they sought their creator many turned from sin at the mere sight of her others amended their lives all were affected at seeing her and experienced heavenly influences in their souls but immediately they forgot the source of these influences for if they could have remained in her presence or could have retained the memory of her image and if god had not prevented it by a mystery nothing would have been able to divert their attention from her and all would have sought her without wavering in such fruitful occupations and in augmenting the gifts and graces from which all this good proceeded our queen the spouse of joseph busied herself during the six months and seventeen days which intervened between her espousal and the incarnation of the word i cannot pretend to refer even briefly to her great heroic acts of all the virtues interior and exterior to all her deeds of charity humility religion and all her works of mercy the alms and benefactions for this exceeds the power of the pen the best i can do is sum up and say that the most high found in most holy mary the fulfilment of all his pleasure and of his wishes as far as is possible in the correspondence of a creature with its creator by her sanctity and merits god felt himself as it were obliged and according to our way of speaking compelled to hasten his steps and extend the arms of his omnipotence to bring about the greatest of wonders conceivable in the world before or after namely the incarnation of the only begotten of the father in the virginal womb of this lady in order to proceed with a dignity befitting himself god prepared most holy mary in a singular manner during the nine days immediately preceding this mystery and allow the river of his divinity to rush impetuously forth psalm forty five verse five to inundate this city of god with its floods he communicated such great graces and gifts and favors that i am struck dumb by the perception of what has been made known to me concerning this miracle and my lowliness is filled with dread at even the mention of what i understood 
for the tongue the pen and the faculties of a creature far below any possibility of revealing such incomprehensible sacraments therefore i wish it to be understood that all i say here is only an insignificant shadow of the smallest part of these wonders and ineffable prodigies which are not at all to be encompassed by our limited words but only by the divine power which i do not possess on the first day of this most blessed novena the heavenly princess mary after a slight rest according to the example of her father david and according to the diurnal order and arrangement laid out for her by the lord left her couch at midnight psalm 118 verse 62 and prostrate in the presence of the most high commenced her accustomed prayer and holy exercises the angels who attended upon her spoke to her and said spouse of our king and lord arise for his majesty calls thee she raised herself with fervent affection and answered the lord commands the dust to raise itself from the dust and turning toward the countenance of the lord who called her she added most high and powerful master what wishest thou to do with me at these words her most holy soul was raised in spirit to a new and higher habitation closer to the same lord and more remote from all earthly and passing things she felt at once that she was being prepared by those illuminations and purifications which at other times she had experienced in some of the most exalted visions of the divinity i do not dwell on them since i have described them in the first part the divinity manifested itself not by an intuitive but by an abstractive vision however so clearly that by it she understood more of this incomprehensible object than what the blessed see and enjoy by intuition for this vision was more exalted and more profound than the others of that kind since this heavenly lady made herself more capable day by day and because she made such perfect use of graces she disposed herself for ever greater ones moreover the repeated enlightenments and visions of the divinity continually enabled her to respond more and more befittingly to its infinite operations in this vision our princess mary learned most high secrets of the divinity and of its perfections and especially of god's communications ad extra in the work of creation she saw that it originated in the goodness and liberality of god that creatures were not necessary for supplementing his divine existence nor for his infinite glory since without them he was glorious through the interminable eternities before the creation of the world many sacraments and secrets were manifested to our queen which neither can nor should be made known to all for she alone was the only one canticles chapter six verse eight and chapter seven verse six the chosen one selected by the highest king and lord of creation for these delights but as her highness in this vision perceived this impulse and inclination of the divinity to communicate itself ad extra with a force greater than that which makes all the elements tend toward their centre and as she was drawn within the sphere of this divine love she besought the eternal father with heart aflame that he send his only begotten into the world and give salvation to men since in this manner he should satisfy and humanly speaking execute the promptings of his divinity and its perfections the petitions of his spouse were very sweet to the lord they were the scarlet lace with which she bound and secured his love and in order to put his desires into execution he sought first to prepare the tabernacle or temple whither he was to descend from the bosom of the eternal father he resolved to furnish his beloved and chosen mother with a clear knowledge of all his works ad extra just as his omnipotence had made them on the first day therefore and in this same vision he manifested to her all that he had made on the first day of the creation of the world as it is recorded in genesis and she perceived all with greater clearness and comprehension than if she had been an eye-witness for she knew them first as they are in god and then as they are in themselves she perceived and understood how the lord in the beginning genesis chapter one verses one and five created heaven and earth in how far and in what way it was void and how the darkness was over the face of the abyss 
how the spirit of the lord hovered over the waters and how at the divine command light was made and what was its nature how after the darkness was divided it was called night and the light day and how thus the first day was made she knew the size of the earth its longitude latitude and depth its caverns hell limbo and purgatory with their inhabitants the countries climes the meridians and divisions of the world and all its inhabitants and occupants with the same clearness she knew the inferior orbs and the empyrean heaven how the angels were made on the first day she was informed of their nature conditions diversity hierarchies offices grades and virtues the rebellion of the bad angels was revealed to her their fall and the occasion and the cause of that fall though the lord always concealed from her that which concerned herself she understood the punishment and the effects of sin in the demons beholding them as they are in themselves and at the conclusion of the first day the lord showed to her how she too was formed of this lowly earthly material and endowed with the same nature as all those who return to the dust he did not however say that she would again return to it yet he gave her such a profound knowledge of the earthly existence that the great queen humiliated herself to the abyss of nothingness being without fault she debased herself more than all the children of adam with all their miseries this whole vision and its effects the most high arranged in such a way as to open up in the heart of mary the deep trenches that were required for the foundations of the edifice which he wished to erect in her namely so high a one that it would reach up to the substantial and hypostatic union of the human and divine nature and as the dignity of mother of god was without limits and to a certain extent infinite it was becoming that she should be grounded in a proportionate humility such as would be without limits though still within the bounds of reason itself attaining the summit of virtue this blessed one among women humiliated herself to such an extent that the most holy trinity was as it were fully paid and satisfied and according to our mode of understanding constrained to raise her to the highest position and dignity possible among creatures and nearest to the divinity itself in this highest benevolence his majesty spoke and said to her my spouse and dove great is my desire of redeeming man from sin and my immense kindness is as it were strained in waiting for the time in which i shall descend in order to repair the world ask me continually during these days and with great affection for the fulfilment of this desire prostrate in my royal presence let not thy petitions and clamors cease asking me that the only begotten of the father descend in reality to unite himself with human nature whereupon the heavenly princess responded and said lord and god eternal whose is all the power and wisdom whose wish none can resist esther chapter thirteen verse nine who shall hinder thy omnipotence who shall detain the impetuous current of thy divinity so that thy pleasure in conferring this benefit upon the whole human race remain unfulfilled if perhaps o oh my beloved i am a hindrance to such an immeasurable benefit let me perish before i impede thy pleasure this blessing cannot depend upon the merits of any creature therefore my lord and master do not wait as we might later on merit it so much the less the sins of men increase and the offences against thee are multiplied how shall we merit the very blessing of which we become daily more unworthy in thee thyself my lord exists the last cause and motive of our salvation thy infinite bounty thy numberless mercies incite thee the groans of thy prophets and of the fathers of thy people solicit thee the saints sigh after thee the sinners look for thee and all of them together call out to thee and if i insignificant wormlet on account of my ingratitude am not unworthy of thy merciful condescension i venture to beseech thee from the bottom of my heart to speed thy coming and to hasten thy redemption for thy greater glory when the princess of heaven had finished this prayer she returned to her ordinary and more natural state but anxious to fulfill the mandate of the lord she continued during that whole day her petitions for the incarnation of the word 
and with the deepest humility she repeated the exercises of prostrating herself to the ground and praying in the form of a cross for the holy ghost who governed her had taught her this posture by which she so highly pleased the most blessed trinity god saw in the body of the future mother of the word as it were the crucified person of christ and therefore he received this morning sacrifice of the most pure virgin as an advance offering of that of his most holy son instruction which the queen of heaven gave me my daughter the mortals are not capable of understanding the ineffable operations of the arm of the omnipotent in preparing me for the incarnation of the eternal word especially during the nine days which preceded this exalted sacrament was my spirit elevated and united with the immutable being of the divinity i was submerged in the ocean of his infinite perfections participating in all those eminent and divine effects which are beyond all presentiment of the human hearts the knowledge of creatures communicated to me penetrated into their very essence so that it was more profound and piercing than that of all the angelic spirits though their knowledge of creation on account of the beatific vision is altogether admirable moreover the images of them all were impressed upon my mind to be used by me according as i desired what i wish of thee to-day is to take notice how i use this knowledge and to imitate me according to thy power with the help of the infused light which thou hast received for this purpose profit by the knowledge of creatures by making of them a ladder to ascend unto god thy creator so that thou mayest seek in all of them their first beginning and their last end let them serve thee as a mirror from which the godhead is reflected reminding thee of his omnipotence and inciting thee to love which he seeks in thee be thou filled with wonder and praise at the greatness and magnificence of the creator and in his presence humiliate thyself to the dust shun no difficulty or suffering in order to become meek and humble of heart take notice my dearest that this virtue of humility was the firm foundation of all the wonders which the most high wrought in me and in order that thou mayest esteem this virtue so much the more remember that of all the others it is at the same time the most precious the most delicate and perishable for if thou lose it in any respect and if thou be not humble in all things without exception thou wilt not be humble in anything remember thy earthly and corruptible nature and be not ignorant of the fact that the most high has providentially formed man in such a way that his own existence and formation intimate and rehearse the important lesson of humility never allowing him to be without this salutary teaching on this account he has not formed him of the most excellent material and has concealed the noblest part of his being in the sanctuary of his interior exodus chapter thirty verse twenty four teaching him to weigh as in a balance on the one side the infinite and eternal existence of the lord and on the other his own ignoble material existence thus he is to give unto god what belongs to him and to himself what belongs to his own self matthew chapter twenty two verse twenty one most zealously i attend to this adjustment becoming an example and guide therein to all the mortals i wish that thou also do it in imitation of me and that thou zealously study to acquire the humility which pleases the most high and myself who desire thy true advancement i wish that thy perfection be built up in the deep trenches of thy own self-knowledge in order that the deeper its foundations are laid to so much the higher and more exalted perfection may rise the edifice of thy virtue thus thy will shall find a most intimate conformity with that of the lord who looks down from the eminence of his throne upon the humble of the earth end of chapter one Book One, Chapter Two of the Mystical City of God, Volume Two, by the Venerable Sister Mary of Jesus of Agreda. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Two. The Lord on the second day continues his favors in preparation for the incarnation of the Word in the Most Holy Mary. 
in the first part of this history i mentioned that the most pure body of mary was conceived and perfectly formed within the space of seven days the most high wished to work this miracle in order that this most holy soul might not have to wait so long as the souls of ordinary mortals he wished it to be created and infused before the usual time as it also really happened in order that this beginning of the reparation of the world might have some similarity to the beginning of its creation this correspondence again took place at the coming of the redeemer so that having formed the new adam christ god might rest as one who had strained all the powers of his omnipotence in the greatest of his works and that he might enjoy the most delicious sabbath of all his delights and as these wonders necessitated the intervention of the mother of the divine word who was to give him a visible form and as she was to unite the two extremes god and man it was proper that she should bear relation to both her dignity was inferior only to that of god and superior to all that was not god to this dignity belonged also a proportionate knowledge and understanding as well of the highest essence of the divinity as also of all the inferior creatures following up his intention the supreme lord continued the favors by which he wished to dispose most holy mary for the incarnation during nine days as i have begun to explain on the second day at the same hour of midnight the virgin mary was visited in the same way as described in the last chapter the divine power raised her up by the same elevations and illuminings to prepare her for the visions of the divinity he manifested himself again in an abstract manner as on the first day and she was shown the works performed on the second day of the creation she learnt how and when god divided the waters genesis chapter one verse six some above and others below establishing the firmament and above it the crystal known also as the watery heaven her insight penetrated into the greatness order conditions and movements and all the other qualities and conditions of the heavens and in the most prudent virgin this knowledge did not lay idle nor remain sterile for immediately the most clear light of the divinity overflowed in her and inflamed and emblazoned her with admiration praise and love of the goodness and power of god being transformed as it were with a godlike excellence she produced heroic acts of all the virtues entirely pleasing to his divine majesty and as in the preceding first day god had made her a participant of his wisdom so on this second day he made her in corresponding measure a participant in the divine omnipotence and gave her power over the influences of the heavens of the planets and elements commanding them all to obey her thus was this great queen raised to sovereignty over the sea the earth the elements and the celestial orbs with all the creatures which are contained therein this sovereignty and supreme power belong to the dignity of most holy mary on account of the reason mentioned above and besides for two other special ones the first because this lady was the privileged queen exempt from the common law of sin and its consequences therefore she was not to be put in the same general class with the insensate sons of adam against whom the omnipotent armed the creatures wisdom chapter five verse eighteen for vengeance of his injuries and for the punishment of their frenzy for if they had not in their disobedience turned against their creator neither would the elements nor their dependencies have been disobedient toward them nor would they have molested them nor turned against them the rigor and inclemency of their activity and if this rebellion of the creatures is a punishment of sin it could not justly extend itself to the most holy mary who was immaculate and without fault nor was it just that she should be less privileged than the angels who were not subject to these consequences of sin or deprived of the dominion over the elementary powers although most holy mary was of corporeal and terrestrial substance yet she raised herself above all corporeal and spiritual creatures and made herself queen and mistress of all creation in this therefore she deserves so much the higher credit as it was the rarer and the more precious more must be conceded to the queen than to her vassals more to the mistress than to the servants 
the second reason is because her most holy son was himself to obey this heavenly queen and his mother since he was the creator of the elements and of all things it follows naturally that they should obey her to whom the creator subjected himself and that they should be commanded by her was not the person of christ himself in so far as his human nature was concerned to be governed by his mother according to the constitution and law of nature this privilege of sovereignty tended also greatly to enhance the virtues and merits of most holy mary for thereby that which in ourselves is usually done under constraint and against our will was performed by her freely and meritoriously this most prudent queen did not use her sovereignty over the elements and the creatures indiscriminately and for her own alleviation and comfort but she commanded the creatures not to suspend their activities and influences in so far as they would naturally be painful and inconvenient to her for in these things she was to be most like her holy son and suffer conjointly with him her love and humility did not permit her to withhold and suspend the inclemencies of the creatures in her regard since she knew how valuable suffering is and how estimable in the eyes of the lord only on some occasions when she saw that it was not for her benefit but necessary for her son and creator the sweet mother restrained the forces of the elements and their influences as we shall see farther on during her journey to egypt and on other occasions when she most prudently judged it proper that the creatures recognize their creator and reverence him or protect and serve him in some necessity what mortal will not marvel at the knowledge of such a new miracle to see a mere earthly creature yet one clothed with the sovereignty and dominion of the whole creation esteem herself in her own eyes as the most unworthy and insignificant of the creatures and in these humble sentiments command the wrath of the winds and all the rigors of the natural elements to turn against her and under obedience fulfill her command in obeying her however these elements full of reverence and courtesy towards such a mistress yielded to her wishes not in vengeance of the wrongs of their creator as they do in regard to the rest of the children of adam but in order to respect her commands in the presence of this humility of our invincible queen we mortals cannot deny our most arrogant vanity and presumption or rather our audacity since seeing that on account of our insane outrages we merit the furious rebellion of the elements and of all the harmful forces of the universe against us we complain of their rigor as if their molestations were an injury we deprecate the rigor of the cold we complain of the exhaustion of heat all painful things we abhor and we condemn with all energy these ministers of divine justice and seek our own comforts and delights as if they were to last for ever and as if it were not certain that we are only drawing therefrom a heavier punishment of our faults but returning to the consideration of the knowledge and power given to the princess of heaven and the other gifts preparing her worthily for the position of mother of god we can understand their excellence for we see in them a certain infinity or boundlessness participating in the divinity and similar to that which was afterwards possessed by the most holy soul of christ for she not only knew all creatures in god but comprehended them in such a way as to master them and at the same time reserve capacity for knowing many others if there had existed more to be known i call this knowledge an infinity because it seems to partake of the qualities of infinite knowledge and because in one and the same action of her mind and without success of advertence she saw and perceived the number of the heavens their latitude and profundity their order motions qualities their matter and form the elements with all their changes and accidents all of these she knew at the same time the only thing the most wise virgin did not know was the immediate end of this knowledge until the moment of her consent and the fulfillment of the ineffable mercy of the most high she continued during these days her most fervent prayers for the coming of the messiah according to the command of the lord and he had given her to understand that he would not tarry as the time destined for his arrival was at hand instruction which the queen of heaven gave me 
my daughter from what thou art going to learn of the favors and blessings conferred upon me in preparation for the dignity of mother of god i wish thee to perceive the admirable order of his wisdom in the creation of man take notice therefore that his creator made him out of nothing not in order to be a slave but in order to be the king and the master of all creation genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and in order that he make use of creatures in sovereignty command and mastery yet at the same time man was to recognize himself as the image of his maker and the work of his hand remaining more devoted to god and more submissive to his will than the creatures to man for all this was demanded by justice and reason and in order that man might not be without information and knowledge of the creator and of the means of perceiving and executing his will he added to his natural light a greater one more penetrating more limpid more certain more free and extensive namely the light of divine faith by which man might know the existence of god and of his perfections and conjointly with these his works furnished with this knowledge and dominion man was established in good standing honored and enriched having no excuse for not devoting himself entirely to the fulfillment of the divine will but the foolishness of man disturbs this order and destroys this harmony when being created as the lord and king of creatures he enslaves himself subjecting himself to them and degrading his dignity in using visible things not as a prudent master but as an unworthy vassal for he debases himself beneath the lowest of creatures by losing sight of the fact that he is their superior all this perversity arises from the use of creatures not for the service of the creator through well-ordered faith but for the indulgence of the passions and the delights of the senses hence also arises man's great abhorrence of those things which are not pleasing to the senses thou my dearest look faithfully toward thy creator and lord and in thy soul seek to copy the image of his divine perfections lose not the mastery and dominion over creatures let none of them infringe upon thy liberty but seek to triumph over all of them allowing nothing to interpose itself between thee and thy creator subject thyself gladly not to the pleasurable in creatures since that will obscure thy understanding and weaken thy will but to the adverse and the painful resulting from their activity suffer this with joyous willingness for i have done the same in imitation of my son although i had the power to neutralize their molestations and had no sins to atone for end of chapter two book one chapter three of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter three what favors the most high conferred on most holy mary on the third day of the novena before the incarnation the right hand of the most high which threw open the doors of the divinity to most holy mary continued to enrich and adorn at the expense of his infinite attributes this most pure spirit and virginal body which he had chosen as his tabernacle as his temple and as the holy city of his habitation and the heavenly lady engulfed in this vastness of the divinity winged her flight day by day farther away from earthly things and transformed herself more and more into a heavenly being discovering ever new sacraments in the most high for as he is the infinite object of desire although the appetite is satiated with that which is received always more remains to be desired and understood not all the hierarchies of the angels nor all men together have attained such preferment in blessings mysteries and sacraments as this princess attained especially as regards those due to her as mother of the creator on the third day of preparation at which i have now arrived having again been prepared as on the first day the divinity manifested itself anew in abstractive vision too slow and inadequate are our powers for understanding the increase of the gifts and graces which the most high then lavished on heavenly mary and at this juncture i am at a loss for words to explain even the least portion of what i perceived 
I can only express myself by saying that the divine wisdom and power proceeded in a manner worthy of her who was to be the mother of the word, so as to ensure, as far as is possible for a creature, that likeness and proportion which was due to the divine persons. Whoever has even a faint understanding of the distance which lies between the two extremes, the infinite God and the limited human creature, can comprehend so much the better what is necessary to bring them together and establish a proportion. More and more the Queen of Heaven reflected his infinite attributes and virtues, more and more brilliantly shone forth her beauty under the touch of the pencil of the divine wisdom and under the colors and lights added to it from on high. On this day she was informed of the works of creation as they happened on the third day. She learned when and how the waters, which were beneath the firmament, flow together in one place. Genesis chapter 1 verse 9 Disclosing the dry land, which the Lord called earth, while he called the waters the sea. She learned in what way the earth brought forth the fresh herbs, and all plants and fructiferous trees with their seeds, each one according to its kind. She was taught and she comprehended the greatness of the sea, its depth and its divisions, its correspondence with the streams and the fountains that take their rise from it and flow back into it, the different plants and herbs, the flowers, trees, roots, fruits, and seeds, she perceived how all and each one of them served the use of man. All this our queen understood and penetrated with the keenest insight more clearly, distinctly, and comprehensibly than Adam or Solomon. In comparison with her, all those skilled in medicine in the world would appear but ignorant even after the most thorough studies and largest experience. The most holy Mary knew all that was hidden from sight, as wisdom says wisdom chapter 7 verse 21 and just as she learned it without any fiction she also communicates it without envy whatever solomon says there in the book of wisdom was realized in her with incomparable and eminent perfection on some occasions our queen made use of this science in order to exercise her charity toward the poor and needy as will be related in the sequence of this history she had it under perfect control, and it was as familiar to her as the well-trained musician is with his instrument. The same was true of the rest of the sciences, whenever she found it desirable or necessary to make use of them in the service of the Most High. For she was mistress of all of them, more perfectly than any of the mortals who ever did excel in any art or science. She was versed in the virtuous qualities and activities of the stones, herbs and plants, and in her was true what Christ our Lord promised to the apostles and first Christians, that poisonous drafts would not hurt them. This privilege belonged to the queen as a sovereign, so that neither poison nor any other thing could ever injure her or cause her any harm except with her permission. These privileges and favors the most prudent princess and lady always kept concealed, and she made no use of them for herself, as I have said, desiring not to be deprived of a share in the suffering which had been chosen by her most holy son. Before conceiving him and becoming his mother, she was inspired with divine knowledge and science concerning the passibility of the word made flesh. And when she became mother, she saw and experienced this truth in her son and Lord himself, and therefore she gave a greater license or rather a more strict command, to creatures to afflict her, since she saw the results of this activity in their own creator. Hence, as the Most High did not wish his only and chosen spouse to be continually molested by the creatures, even though she herself desired it, he often restrained them and neutralized their operations, so that the heavenly princess, unhindered by them, might occasionally enjoy the delights of the Most High King. There is another special favor, which the Most Holy Mary received for the benefit of the mortals on the third day and in that vision of the divinity. For during this vision, God manifested to her in a special way the desire of his divine love to come to the aid of men and to raise them up from all their miseries. In accordance with the knowledge of his infinite mercy and the object for which it was conceded, the Most High gave to Mary a certain kind of participation of his own attributes, in order that afterwards, as the mother and advocate of sinners, 
she might intercede for them this participation of the most holy mary in the love of god and in his inclination to help her was so heavenly and powerful that if from that time on the strength of the lord had not come to her aid she would not have been able to bear the impetuosity of her desire to assist and save mankind filled with this love and charity she would if necessary or feasible have delivered herself an infinite number of times to the flames to the sword and to the most exquisite torments of death for their salvation all the torments sorrows tribulations pains infirmities she would have accepted and suffered and she would have considered them a great delight for the salvation of sinners whatever all men have suffered from that beginning of the world till this hour and whatever they will suffer till the end would have been a small matter for the love of this most merciful mother let therefore mortals and sinners understand what they owe to most holy mary from that day on we can say the heavenly lady continued to be the mother of kindness and great mercy and for two reasons first because from that moment she sought with an especial and anxious desire to communicate without envy the treasures of grace which she had comprehended and received and therefore such an admirable sweetness grew up in her heart that she was ready to communicate it to all men and to shelter them in her heart in order to make them participants of the divine love which there was enkindled secondly because this love of most holy mary for the salvation of men was one of the principal dispositions required for conceiving the eternal word in her virginal womb it was eminently befitting that she should be all mercy kindness piety and clemency who was herself to conceive and give birth to the word made man since he in his mercy clemency and love desired to humiliate himself to the lowliness of our nature and wished to be born of her in order to suffer for men it is said like begets like just as the water partakes of the qualities of the minerals through which it flows and although the birth of christ originated in the divinity yet it also partook of the conditions of the mother as far as was possible she therefore would not have been suitable for concurrence with the holy spirit in this conception in which only the activity of the man was wanting if she had not been endowed with perfections corresponding to those of the humanity of christ the most holy mary issued from this vision with ever increasing fervor during all the rest of the day she occupied herself in the prayers and petitions commanded her by the lord the heart of her spouse was wounded with love so that according to our mode of thinking he already longed for the day and the hour when he should rest in the arms and recline at the breast of his beloved instruction which the most holy queen gave me my dearest daughter great were the favors which the hand of the most high showered upon me in the visions of the divinity vouchsafed me during the nine days before his conception in my womb and although he did not manifest himself intuitively and altogether unveiled yet he did it in an exalted manner and with such effects as are reserved to his wisdom in the remembrance of what i perceived in this vision i rose to the true perception of the position which god held in comparison to men and men in comparison to god my heart was inflamed with love and was torn with sorrow for i realized the immensity of his love towards mortals and their most ungrateful oblivion of his incomprehensible goodness many times would i have died at the thought of these extremes if god himself had not comforted and preserved me this sacrifice of his servant was most pleasing to his majesty and he accepted it with greater complacency than all the holocausts of the old law for he beheld my humility and delighted in it very much whenever i performed these exercises he showed great mercy to me and to my people these sacraments my dearest i manifest to thee in order to encourage thee to imitate me as far as is possible will thy weak forces aided by grace look upon the works which thou hast learnt of as a pattern and example to be closely followed meditate much and weigh over and over again as well as in the light of grace as in that of reason how exactly mortals ought to correspond to this immense kindness of god and to his eagerness to assist them compare at the same time the heartless obduracy of the children of adam 
I wish that thy heart be softened in affectionate thankfulness toward the Lord, and melted in sorrow at these unhappy proceedings of men. I assure thee, my daughter, that on the day of the general adjustment, the cause of the greatest wrath of the just judge shall be man's most ungrateful forgetfulness of this truth, and the confusion of men on account of this wrath shall be such, that on that day they would of their own accord cast themselves into the abyss of pain, if there were no ministers of divine justice, to visit this retribution upon them. In order to avoid such an abominable fault, and in order to forestall such a horrible chastisement, renew in thyself the memory of the blessings, which thou hast received at the hands of his love and infinite clemency, and remember that God has distinguished thee in preference to the souls of many generations. Do not make the mistake of considering these great favors and special gifts as conferred on thee for thyself alone. They were conferred also for the sake of thy brethren, for the divine mercy is extended to all men. Therefore the return, which thou owest to the Lord, must be made first for thyself, then for thy brethren. And because thou art poor, offer up the life and merits of my most holy son, and with them all that I have suffered by the forces of my love. Thus wilt thou make thyself pleasing to God, and tender some recompense for the ingratitude of mortals. In all these things, exercise thyself repeatedly many times, remembering in the meanwhile what I thought and felt in similar acts and exercises. End of chapter 3 Book 1, Chapter 4 of The Mystical City of God, Volume 2, by the Venerable Sister Mary of Jesus of Agreda. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 1, Chapter 4 The Most High Continues His Favors to Most Holy Mary on the Fourth Day. Still the favors and most exalted mysteries of the Most High toward our Queen and Lady in preparing her for approaching dignity of motherhood, continued. The fourth day of this preparation had arrived, and at the same hour she was again raised to the abstractive vision of the divinity. But this vision was accompanied by new effects of exalted enlightenments in this most pure soul. The divine power and wisdom has no bounds or limits. To his operations only our will, or the limitation of our created nature, offers resistance but in the will of most holy Mary, the divine power found no hindrance, for all her works were executed with plenitude of holiness, and entirely according to the pleasure of the Lord, drawing him on, as he himself said, and wounding his heart with love. Canticles chapter 4 verse 9 Only in so far as most holy Mary was a mere creature, was the power of the divine arm limited, but within these limits, it could act without bound or restriction, and without measure, offering her the waters of wisdom from the purest and most crystalline founts of the divinity. The Most High manifested to her in this vision, by most special enlightenments, the new law of grace which the Redeemer of the world was to establish, the sacraments contained in it, the end for which he would leave them in his new church of the gospel, the gifts and blessings prepared for men, and his desire, that all should be saved, and that all should reap the fruit of the redemption. And so it was the wisdom which the Most Holy Mary drew from these visions, wherein she was taught by the highest teacher and the corrector of the wise. Wisdom chapter 7 verse 15 That if by any means man or angel could describe it, more books would have been written of this science of Our Lady, than all those which have been composed in this world, concerning all the arts and sciences, and all the inventions of men. And no wonder her science was greater than that of all other men, for into the heart and mind of our princess was emptied and exhausted the ocean of divinity, which the sins and the evil disposition of the creatures had confined, repressed, and circumscribed. It was concealed within its own source until the proper time, which was no other than the hour in which she was chosen as mother of the only begotten of the Father. Joined with the sweetness of this divine science, our queen felt a loving yet piercing sorrow, which this very science continued to renew. She perceived in the Most High the ineffable treasures of grace and blessings, 
which he had prepared for mortals and she saw the weight of the divinity as it were inclined toward the desire of seeing all men enjoy them eternally at the same time she saw and considered the wicked disposition of the world and how blindly mortals impeded the flow of these treasures and deprived themselves of participation of the divinity from this resulted a new kind of martyrdom full of grief for the perdition of men and of the desire of remedying such lamentable loss this caused her to offer up the most exalted prayers petitions sacrifices humiliations and heroic acts of love of god and of men in order that no one if possible should henceforth damn himself and that all should recognize their creator and redeemer confess him adore and love him all this took place in this very vision but as these petitions were of the same kind as those already described i do not expatiate on them here in conjunction therewith the lord showed her also the works of creation performed on the fourth day genesis chapter one verses fourteen to seventeen the heavenly princess mary learned how and when the luminaries of heaven were formed in the firmament for dividing day and night and for indicating the seasons the days and the years how for this purpose was created the great light of heaven the sun presiding as the lord of the day and joined with it the moon the lesser light which reigns over the darkness of the night in like manner were formed the stars of the eighth heaven in order that they might gladden the night with their brilliance and preside with their various influences over both the day and the night she understood what was the material substance of these luminous orbs their form their size their properties their various movements and uniformity as well as the inequality of the planets she knew the number of the stars and all their influences exerted upon the earth both in regard to the living and the lifeless creatures the effects and changes which they cause in them by their influences this is not in conflict with what the prophet says psalm 146 verse 4 that god knows the number of the stars and has called them by their names for david does not thereby deny to his majesty the liberty of conceding to a creature that as a privilege which he possesses by nature it is plain that since this knowledge is communicable and since it would contribute to mary's excellence it should not be denied to her has he not conferred upon her greater favors and has he not made her the queen of the stars and of all other creatures and this knowledge was as it were only a sequel of her dominion and sovereignty over the powers influences and movements of all the celestial orbs since they were commanded to obey her as their queen and lady in consequence of this command which the lord gave to the celestial orbs and in accordance with the dominion which most holy mary obtained over them she possessed such a power that if she commanded the stars to leave their positions in heaven they would obey her instantly and would hasten to the regions which she chose to designate the same is true of the sun and the planets all would pause in their course and suspend their operations to execute the command of mary i have already said above that sometimes her highness made use of this sovereignty for as we shall see farther on it happened a few times in egypt where the rays of the sun are exceedingly strong that she commanded the sun to moderate its heat and not to molest or fatigue the infant god its master and the sun obeyed her therein causing inconvenience and suffering to her because she wished it and yet respecting the tender years of the sun of justice whom she held in her arms the same happened also with other stars and on a few occasions she detained the sun in its course as i will mention later many other hidden sacraments of the most high manifested to our great queen in these visions and what i have said and will say of all these mysteries leaves me dissatisfied and with a heart as it were torn asunder for i see that i can say little of that which i understand and in proportion i understand still less of what really did happen to the heavenly lady many of the mysteries concerning her are reserved for the last day when her most holy son shall proclaim them since now we are not capable of receiving their revelation the most holy mary issued from this vision still more inflamed and filled with the divinity entirely transformed by the knowledge of god's attributes and perfections 
and her advance in virtues kept pace with her progress in divine favors she multiplied her requests her fervent sighs and her meritorious works in order to hasten the incarnation of the word and our salvation instruction which the heavenly queen gave me my daughter i wish that thou busy thyself much in meditating and pondering upon that which thou hast understood of my doings and sufferings at the time when the most high gave me such a deep insight into his goodness which drew him as with an infinite force to enrich men and which he showed me the want of correspondence and the dark ingratitude of the mortals when i turn from the consideration of this most liberal condescension of the most high to the perception and understanding of the foolish hard-heartedness of the sinners my soul was pierced with an arrow of mortal anguish which remained for life and i wish to tell thee of another mystery many times the most high in order to heal the affliction and consternation of my heart in this sorrow sought to console me by saying except thou my spouse the gifts which the blind and ignorant world in its unworthiness despises and is incapable of receiving and understanding with these words the most high was accustomed to set free the currents of his divine bounty which rejoice my soul more than human powers can comprehend or tongue explain i desire therefore that thou my friend be now my companion in the sorrow which i suffered and which is so little noticed by the living in order to imitate me therein and in the effects of this most just grief thou must deny thyself forget thyself entirely and crown thy heart with the thorns of sorrow at the behavior of mortals weep thou seeing them laugh at their eternal damnation for such weeping is the most legitimate occupation of the true spouses of my most holy son let them seek their delight only in the tears which they pour out on account of their sins and those of the ignorant world thus prepare thy heart in order that the lord may make thee a participant of his treasures not in order to become rich but in order that his majesty may fulfil his most generous love toward thee and in order that souls may find justification imitate me in all that i teach thee since thou knowest that this is my desire in favoring thee end of chapter four book one chapter five of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter five his majesty manifests new mysteries and sacraments together with the works of the fifth day of the creation to most holy mary and her highness continues to pray for the incarnation of the word the fifth day of the novena which the most blessed trinity celebrated in the temple of most holy mary in order that the eternal word might assume human flesh in her had arrived just as in the preceding days she was elevated to an abstractive vision of the divinity and as the veil fell more and more from the secrets of the infinite wisdom she discovered new mysteries also during this day for the preparations and enlightenments emitted ever stronger rays of light and divine graces which flashed into her most holy soul and emptied the treasures of infinity into her faculties assimilating and transforming the heavenly lady more and more to a likeness of her god in order to make her worthy of being his mother in this vision showing himself to her with ineffable signs of affection the most high spoke to the heavenly queen and manifested to her additional secrets saying my spouse and my dove in the secret of my bosom thou hast perceived the immense bounty to which my love for the human race inclines me and the treasures which are secretly prepared for their happiness so powerful is this love in me that i wish to give them my only begotten for their instruction and salvation thou hast also seen something of the small returns of their most listless ingratitude and contempt in which men hold my clemency and love yet although i have shown thee part of their malice i wish my friend that thou shouldest once more know in me how small is the number of those who are to know and love me as my chosen ones and how great and extended is the number of the ungrateful and the reprobate 
the innumerable sins and abominations of these impure and defiled men whom i have foreseen in my infinite knowledge retard my bounteous mercy and have locked up the treasure-house of my divinity making the world entirely unworthy of receiving my gifts the princess mary through these words of the most high was instructed in the great mysteries regarding the number of the predestined and the reprobate and also regarding the hindrances and impediments by which sinful men delayed the coming of the eternal word as man into the world having present before herself the vision both of the infinite bounty and the equity of the creator and of the measureless iniquity and malice of men the most prudent mistress inflamed by the fire of divine love spoke to his majesty and said my lord and infinite god of wisdom and incomprehensible sanctity what mystery is this which thou hast manifested to me without measure are the misdeeds of men so that only thy wisdom can comprehend them but can all these and many more perhaps extinguish thy bounty and love or vie with them no my lord and master it must not be so the malice of men must not detain thy mercy i am the most useless of all the human race yet on its behalf i remind thee of thy fidelity infallibly true it is that heaven and earth will come to naught before thy word can fail isaiah chapter fifty one verse six and it is also true that thou hast many times given thy word through the holy prophets and thou hast promised them by word of mouth a redeemer and our salvation how then my god can these promises fail of fulfilment without conflicting with thy infinite wisdom or how can man be deceived without conflicting with thy infinite goodness in order to induce thee to fulfil thy promise and to secure them eternal felicity through thy incarnate word i have nothing to offer on the part of mortals nor can any creature oblige thee and if this blessing could be merited then thy infinite and bounteous clemency would not thereby be glorified only through thy own self can this obligation be imposed upon thee for only in god can a sufficient reason be found for his becoming man in thee alone was the reason and the motive for our creation and therefore in thee alone also the reason for our reparation after our fall do not seek my god and most high king for merits nor for a greater motive than thy own mercy and the exaltation of thy holy name it is true my spouse answered the most high that on account of my goodness i bound myself to the promise of vesting myself in human nature and of dwelling among them and that no one can merit in my sight such a promise but the ungrateful behavior of men so abominable in my sight and in my justice does not merit the execution of this promise for though i seek only their eternal happiness as a return of my love i perceive and find only obduracy by which they are certain to waste and despise the treasures of my grace and blessing they will yield thorns instead of fruit great insults for benefits and base ingratitude for my unbounded and generous mercy and the end of all these evils will be for them the privation of my vision in eternal torments take notice of these truths recorded in the secrets of my wisdom my friend and weigh these great sacraments for to thee my heart is laid open so that thou canst see the justice of my proceeding it is impossible to describe the hidden secrets which most holy mary then saw in the lord for she perceived in him all the creatures of the past present and the future and the position of each one in creation the good and bad actions and the final ending of each one if she had not been strengthened she could not have preserved her life under the effects and feelings caused by the knowledge and insight into these hidden sacraments and mysteries but as his majesty in these new miracles and blessings had such high ends in view he was not sparing but most liberal with the beloved one whom he had chosen as his mother and as our queen derived this science from the bosom of god itself she participated also in the fire of his eternal charity which inflamed her with the love of god and the neighbor therefore continuing her intercession she said lord and eternal god invisible and immortal i confess thy justice i magnify thy works i adore thy infinite essence and hold in reverence thy judgments 
my heart melts within me with tenderest affection when i perceive thy unlimited bounty toward men and their dark ingratitude and grossness toward thee for all of them o oh my god thou seekest eternal life but there are few who are thankful for this inestimable benefit and many who will perish by their malice if on this account o oh my eternal good thou relinquishest thy undertaking we mortals are lost but while thou in thy divine foreknowledge perceivest the sins and the malice of men who offend thee so much thou also foreseest thy only begotten made man and his works of infinite price and value in thy sight and these will counterbalance and exceed the malice of sin beyond all comparison through this god-man let thy equity be conquered and on his account give us him now and in order to urge my petitions on thee once more in the name of the human race i unite myself with the spirit of this word already made man in thy mind and pray for his coming in fact and for the eternal life of men through his hands at this prayer of most pure mary the eternal father in our way of speaking represented to himself his only begotten as born in the virginal womb of this great queen and he was moved by her humble and loving petitions his apparent hesitation was merely a device of his tender love in order to enjoy so much the longer the voice of his beloved causing her sweet lips to distill most sweet honey canticles chapter four verse eleven and her emissions to be like those of paradise canticles chapter four verse thirteen and to draw out some more this loving contention the lord answered her my sweetest spouse and chosen dove great is that which thou askest of me and little is that which obliges me on the part of men how then shall such a singular blessing be conferred on those unworthy ones leave me my friend to treat them according to their evil deserts our powerful and kind advocate responded no my master i will not desist from my importunity if much i ask i ask it of thee who are rich in mercies powerful in action and true in thy words my father david said of thee and of the eternal word the lord hath sworn and he will not repent thou art a priest for ever according to the order of melchizedek psalm 109 verse 4 let then that priest come who is at the same time to be sacrificed for our rescue let him come since thou canst not repent of thy promise for thou dost not promise in ignorance let me be clothed o oh my sweet love with the strength of this man god which will not let me put a stop to my importunity until thou give me thy blessing as to my father jacob genesis chapter thirty two verse twenty six in this contest just as it happened to jacob our lady and queen was asked what was her name and she said i am a daughter of adam formed by thy hands from the insignificant dust and the most high answered henceforth thou shalt be called chosen for the mother of the only begotten but the latter part of this name was heard only by the courtiers of heaven while to her it was as yet hidden until the proper time she therefore heard only the word chosen having thus protracted this amorous contention according to the disposition of his divine wisdom and as far as served to inflame the heart of this elected one the most blessed trinity gave to mary our most pure queen the explicit promise that they would now send into the world the eternal word made man filled with incomparable joy and exultation by this fiat she asked and received the benediction of the most high thus this strong woman issued forth from the contest with god more victorious than jacob for she came out rich strong and laden with spoils and the one that was wounded and weakened to speak in our way was god himself for he was drawn by the love of this lady to clothe himself in that sacred bridal chamber of her womb with the weakness of our passable nature he disguised and enveloped the strength of his divinity so as to conquer in allowing himself to be conquered and in order to give us life by his death let the mortal see and acknowledge how most holy mary next to her most blessed son is the cause of our salvation 
during this vision were also revealed to this great queen the works of the fifth day of the creation in the manner in which they happened she saw how by the force of the divine command were engendered and produced in the waters beneath the firmament the imperfect reptiles which creep upon the earth the winged animals that course through the air and the finny tribes that glide through the watery regions of all these creatures she knew the beginnings the substance the form and figure according to their kinds she knew all the species of the animals that inhabit the fields and woods their conditions peculiarities their uses and connections she knew the birds of heaven for so we call the atmosphere with the varied forms of each kind their ornaments feathers their lightness the innumerable fishes of the seas and the rivers the differences between the whales their forms composition and qualities their caverns and foods furnished them by the sea the ends which they serve the use to which they can be put in the world his majesty especially commanded all these hosts of creatures to recognize and obey most holy mary giving her the power to command all of them as it happened on many occasions to be mentioned later on therewith she issued from the trance of this day and she occupied herself during the rest of it in the exercises and petitions which the most high had pointed out to her instruction which the heavenly lady gave me my daughter the more complete knowledge of the wonderful operations of the arm of the almighty in raising me during the abstractive visions of the divinity to the dignity of mother is reserved for the predestined when they shall come to know them in the heavenly jerusalem there they shall understand and see them in the lord himself and with that special delight and astonishment which the angels experienced when the most high revealed these things to them for his exaltation and praise and since his majesty has shown himself so lovingly generous toward thee giving thee in preference to all the generations of men such great knowledge and light concerning these so hidden sacraments i desire my friend that thou signalize thyself above all creatures in praising and magnifying his holy name for the works of his powerful arm in my regard at the same time thou must strive with all thy power to imitate me in the works which i perform by the aid of these great and wonderful blessings pray and sigh for the eternal salvation of thy brethren and that the name of my son may be extolled by all and known to the whole world thou must establish the habit of this kind of prayer by a constant resolve founded upon firm faith and unshaken confidence and by never losing sight of thy misery in profound humility and self-abasement thus prepared thou must battle with the divine love for the good of thy people firmly convinced that the most glorious triumphs of divine love may especially be looked for in its dealings with the humble who love god in uprightness raise thyself above thyself and give him thanks for the special blessings conferred upon thee and for those conferred upon the human race transformed by this divine love thou wilt merit other gifts both for thyself and for thy brethren and whenever thou findest thyself in his divine presence do thou ask for his benediction end of chapter five